Uh, radiation covers nearly 10% of Japan. You heard me right. Japan is now admitting that about, well, they say 8%, but you know how they lie and fudge the numbers. We're going to call it nearly 10. Maybe it's 15. We don't know. Japan's science ministry says 8% of the country's surface area has been contaminated by radiation from the crippled, crippled, how about destroyed, Fukushima nuclear plant. It says that more than 30,000 square kilometers of the country has been blanketed by radioactive cesium. The ministry says most of its containment and contamination, rather, was caused by four large plumes of radiation spewed out by the Fukushima nuclear plant in the first two, those explosions, you remember them. Well, I'm going to add to that, that a hell of a lot of these western United States have been blanketed with cesium as well. How much? I can't tell you. But it is measurable. We have been measuring it. We know it was here. And it's still coming over in the rain. Here to talk to us about that and many more things is Dr. Bill Deagle. Hello, Bill. Welcome. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's uh, important that people kind of get informed. There's a lot of disinformation, of course. I wanted to deal with the hot story that's out there about Dr. Chris Busby. And, uh, and I want, uh, actually, what I did is I tried to pull up the latest stories because Dr. Busby has done a lot of great and positive things in the past. This uh, issue with uh, detoxification and testing is something that I've recommended that uh, you have to, whenever you do a medical test, you have to say, does it change my treatment? And if there's an ongoing exposure, it's like, how can I say it's like doing a lung test on someone that's smoking five packs of cigarettes a day. It's kind of a waste of time. So while the weeping wound of Fukushima continues, we know we're being irradiated. We know we're being toxically exposed. Uh, then you want to uh, consult for environmental experts like myself that work in the academy that know how to detox people and know how to prevent them from getting exposure. Now, the first thing I tell people, number one, is don't dance in the rain. In other words, when it's raining outside, stay you indoors. Pull radioisotopes yeah. out of the air. Mm -hmm. And when it's landing on your car or you're breathing in the vapor, you're being exposed. Now, most of the particles are going to be swallowed and go down your GI tract. Most people don't realize that a liter and a half to two liters of mucus, which comes from the mucosillary blanket of your lungs and your bronchi, and the respiratory bronchioles is being washed down And your down sinuses, your GI tract. everything else. It's, uh, the, the yeah, and you do something as simple as a probiotic, according yeah. to Dr. Osaf Durakovich, who's a triple board specialist, did a study over 25 years ago and showed that just a probiotic like our Living probiotic or living probiotic ultra, which mm -hmm. is a military grade, mm -hmm. will prevent 95% absorption of strontium and cesium. That's really? all. Yes. Wow. Now, when you add things oh. like liquid zeolite, our liquid zeolite is very cheap. It's actually uh -huh. cheaper than anyone else. This is very simple for yourself or your pets to take in because most of your radioisotopes are going to go down your GI tract. And if you grab them and pull them out in your stool, a simple way is if you have a $429 uh, Inspector Plus or $450 Inspector Plus and you scan over the toilet, and it goes click, 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 you know that it's no longer in you. So it's really unnecessary for people to be doing testing. Uh, uh, so and the second thing is if you just take minerals. That are we we like need to healthy. tell people, Bill, what the basic premise of the Monbiot article criticizing Busby said. Well, I think what they're trying to say is that basically they're saying that he is, uh, the Monbiot, of course, is a monster. This fellow is a devil incarnate. I'm sure he gets up in the morning with his black shoe polish yeah. and gets in the mirror and he starts with this automated shoe polisher, and he raise, lowers his, he brings his hair back, his hair piece, and he polishes those little horns. Probably okay. so does. So is a sociopath. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is they don't want any testing. I have been trying for now seven years to do radioactive testing on debris that I have from people in apartments right across the World Trade Center, and I have been blocked literally at every step of the way, including threats that I will be arrested or visited by Homeland Security within a half an hour if I request the specific types of tests that they want not to ever come to the light of day. So one of the things that Dr. Busby has done, which is heroic, is to actually test air filters from Japanese cars at certified labs, which is correct. That was I, very smart. Yeah. I think what he did, which was a little bit, got himself into trouble, was he tried to, quote, have his own foundation, try to make supplements to see if they could, uh, you know, block the radiation. Well, I think what he did also was allow somebody to basically use his name, who was clearly and obviously profiteering selling right. calcium that's... and magnesium supplements. Now, all of us make mistakes, but I think he made a, a mistake there. And, of course, the Mombiot and these monsters want to seize on it because they want to say we're all falling off the edge of the uh, environmental uh, nutcase uh, you know, bandwagon. 
fact is that uh, Dr. Busby is not in that case. He was genuinely concerned over this and knew that calcium would compete. Now, I've got to explain something here important. If you have 100 calcium ions and you have one strontium uh, atom in solution, the body will crave the strontium and grab a hold of it much more avidly than it will the calcium ions. So, yes, you can kind of try to populate it out, but it's not the most efficient way to prevent strontium from being absorbed, okay? Because strontium has an avidity, things like liquid zeolite and things like our Keylor Max, which we have at Nutramedical, will grab a hold of it very efficiently and you don't absorb it. So I tell people, first off, don't sweat if you're living in North America. If you're living in Japan, you should have gotten out months ago. Now, what's going to happen in Japan, and this is something very concerning, is that much of Japan, because of the coastal effect, that this continues to be pushed back in. If you're along anywhere within five to seven kilometers of the coast, you're going to get irradiated by what's called the washing up of the tidal effect, intertidal effect, where those particles are revaporized. All of ocean. them. They're micro droplets, and they micro go right into the air. Come in. Yeah. And the, and the other thing people have to understand is that most of the pollution, probably more than 90 percent of it, went out into the Pacific Ocean and entered the Black Current or the Humboldt. Well, officially it's 80, but it's probably higher than that. You're yeah, right. it's probably higher. We don't know, but we're now, just now ballparking keep, it. Keep in mind, it out. this is important what Bill said. Anytime, if you've ever lived along the ocean, I have, anytime you're within, what is it, five or six kilometers, you say, or miles? I didn't. Yeah, get around it. five or six kilometers. Okay, now, the ocean and the waves create a constant enormous layer of mist and aerosolized microparticulates particula of moisture. Those droplets can carry all kinds of fun and games. And they go everywhere, but most of all, they go into people's noses and down into their lungs. Exactly. Now, what happens with the Humboldt current, it carries it along the ocean floor, and there's several different currents. Some of them move very slowly on the surface, but the Humboldt current moves pretty quickly. It's probably come to North America months ago. And it moved firstly uh, as it comes and splits uh, toward Alaska and then goes south along the California coast all along the Baja and then returns in the oceans because they have circulatory patterns like the circulation of our cardiac circulation as arteries and veins. The danger here is that there's going to be a constant uh, supply of these radioisotopes that are going to get in the food chain. And they're also going to be aerosolized in the ocean currents and the ocean surface so they get into what's called the hydrological cycle. Now, the problem is that, that none of the agencies, none of the governments want to do tests, including the Canadian, who are very sneaky, and continue to say, oh, there's, there's no such thing as radiation in the same Well, their West course. Coast fish test pretty well fried their butts, and my, they, they lied. I mean, they, they wouldn't even oh, tell yeah, people where they got the fish, and they said, yes, there's cesium in there, but there's nowhere near enough to worry about. But the bottom line is, what the hell is the cesium doing in there? They didn't well, talk about that. Well, if there's any that. cesium... If there's any cesium in them, and when you're talking about something Correct. that transits across the Atlantic or the Pacific Ocean, you're transiting 5,500 miles, you have to think, oh, my gosh. You know, the solution to pollution is not dilution. If it crosses the Pacific Ocean, the largest ocean by a very large margin in the world, and still can get accumulated, bioaccumulated within months. Off the West Coast. Off the West Coast, but it's going to continue for decades because yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. there's nothing in sight. In fact, what they're now saying openly is it'll take 30 years to disassemble the plant. 30 years. Now, before it was a year, then it was 10 years, now it's 30 years. Yep. In reality, what they have is a weeping wound that if they invent new technology, they may control it within a century. Doesn't matter if they disassemble it, because the corium is down into the ground now. Right. Now, what we're having is we're going to have what's called uh, these, if you want to call it, uh, now it's, it's below, we're not talking about a meltdown, we're talking about a melt through the corium. Melt through, melt out, and a hydrovolcanic explosion. Yeah, exactly. The hydrovolcanic means basically you've got transient critical reactions occurring, creating a lot of tritium and uh, superheated steam. And a combination of that and the radioisotopes that are being generated from these reactions will build up, and like a volcano, cause explosions that can build up for months or years before the event. <clears throat> They'll also create what's called these steam tubes. When they superheat, they can go, steam tubes can go 50, 100 kilometers or more. Well, we already so they, have uh, fissures in the ground going down 60 feet. Right, and these steam tubes have already been identified, including in the, in the air shafts and the subway tunnels in Tokyo, that uh -huh. they're picking up uh -huh. radiation there. Uh -huh. And my guess is these yep. steam tubes arrived there, and the Japanese government could do ground-penetrating radar to find these steam tubes, but some of them may be a sufficiently large size you could pick up on a ground-penetrating radar very easily. So when I'm saying this, People in Japan better start asking, asking the Japanese government or independent agencies to do GPR 
to find out that there's a whole series I call a spider's nest of radioactive steam tubes emanating out from Fukushima. Okay, because this is going to carry this stuff. It could pop up. The whole the island has got tubes through it. It's volcanic. Right. And the, the fact is, whenever you have volcanoes, you're going to have dormant volcanic tubes, just like the ones in, in Hawaii. If you go there, one of the first tourist things they do is they say, hey, do you want to see our volcanic tubes? I'm thinking, well, what do you mean it's a big volcanic tube? The first time I saw one about 20 years ago, I thought, these are weird. I mean, they're like perfectly, you know, walled out giant tubes where at one point there was magma, you know, at 6,000 degrees flying through that, and eventually when the magma left, it left this cool tube that looked really amazing. Some of them were big enough you can walk through. So that's number one. Number two <clears throat> is there's no attempt whatsoever to control this disaster, and they haven't done anything to think out of the box. For example, if you just think of it, you should create what's called a corium catcher. It's too late now. That corium is long below the reactor. And because it's so close to the ocean, there's probably continuous um, connection with the water. And one of the analogies I use in Northern California, when they started pumping out too much water from the the uh, aquifer of Northern California from the area around the Sacramento River, they discovered that if they kept on pumping, all of a sudden they got salty water because it was coming from the ocean seven miles in. The same thing is going to happen in Japan. You're going to start seeing that... <clears throat> The amount of connection to the ocean indicates that probably the vast majority of this pollution entered the oceans. And what we're going to have is this weeping wound is going to affect not only Japan, but the whole northern hemisphere. And if it continues for years, the first types of range of symptoms, number one, we're seeing very little growth in children because it's affecting their hypothalamus and pituitary, their growth hormone, and their GI tract. It'll affect their blood cells, and we'll start seeing activity in cells that are most stressed, which are your crypt cells in your gut, your bone marrow cells, your neuroglial cells that support the brain, your neurons, etc. all these different we call radiosensitive cell lines. And you're going to start seeing more decorticate activity, which is like people who are crazy. You're going to start seeing more behavior like that. You'll see immune system failure, and you'll see the rise in those populations of pathogenic viruses and bacteria because with their weak immune systems, this is an example of what happened with the falls of Lombardy um, financial system in the 14th century as a result of the Black Death. Hmm. When you have a weakened population that's exposed to extreme stress and malnutrition, they are a prime candidate to start super pathogens like the Black Death. And we know, in fact, that the way that pathogens are made in biological weapons labs, they discovered this inadvertently, was to expose an animal that can carry a pathogen to a cyclotron or a radiation source and he stressed or malnourished.